over a decade. She was born in Terre Haute and has lived all over the world as a military kid. She is 37 and was paralyzed at the age of 26 by a rare autoimmune, autoimmune disease called transverse mellitus. And I'm pretty sure I butchered that pretty badly, so I apologize about that. And with that being said, Mimi, I'm gonna have you kind of go through um, a lot of these diagnoses after I finish the introduction, because I don't wanna get them wrong, and I think that's important. Um, Misty is an active is active in South Bend's adaptive sports community. She is the president of the South Bend's River City Rollers wheelchair basketball team and the River City Sled Rovers sled hockey teams. She enjoys many adaptive sports like wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis, sled hockey, adaptive water skiing, among many others. She mentors newly injured spinal cord patients and speaks and teaches in the schools about living with a disability. Misty works for the city of South Bend's venues at parks and parks, <laughs> venues, South Bend venues, parks and rec as an administrative assistant at Howard Park. Thank you, Mimi, so much for joining us tonight. We're so thrilled to have you here. Thank you, thank you. And so I see, um, ah, Ah, uh, yes. Let's ask to, there you go. Ask to unmute you. Hi, welcome so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and actually, would you mind kind of going through some of the other um, issues that you have just so that we're aware yeah. and pronounce them because I just know I was going to butcher that. I saw okay. that and I was like, oh dear. I was paralyzed at age 26 by a rare autoimmune disease, transverse myelitis. Transverse myelitis is related to multiple sclerosis and um, it attacks the myelin sheath surrounding the spinal cord. And um, so that um, some people recover and some don't. Some people can walk again. I wasn't able to, but I was also born with the genetic disease Ehlers-Danio syndrome or EDS for short. And it is a genetic connective tissue disease that has many comorbidities. Um, it's like my body makes faulty connective tissues. So, um, and it doesn't matter. You could, you could take all of the, um, I can't remember <laughs> what it's called. It also, so EDS also causes a lot of brain fog. So um, I can't remember like what, some of the natural medicines are. Um, if I took more of something that helps build connective tissue, it would just make more faulty connective tissue. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, so um, I also have a uh, mast cell activation syndrome. Basically my immune system attacks my body like and it's not, a lot of times it's just, it acts like allergies, but I can have random allergic reactions to anything, like mm -hmm. someone's perfume that I've not smelled before. My immune system just like decides to uh, blow up. Okay. And then I also have gastroparesis, which is basically paralyzed stomach. Um, I have, it's, uh, delayed gastric emptying. So it doesn't matter how much I try to eat or how little it just sits in my stomach for sometimes even up to a couple of days. Okay. Yeah. And then I also have POTS, which is um, tachycardia. It's positional orthostatic tachycardia. So sometimes my heart is, it, my heart rate at normal rest is about 130 to 150. So it's like racing all the time. And I have trouble um, hydrating my body because of that. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that because I would not have been able to explain that the way that you just did. And I'm really grateful mm -hmm. for it. Thank you. So um, for, I guess my first question for you is after watching this film, I, I imagine that this is not the first time that you've seen this. But what was your initial reaction when you first saw a film that really represented um, the community? Yeah, I wasn't born until 84. 
So when this finally came out, I had heard the story of Camp Jeanette and the, the story behind um, the 504 and everything, but I had never seen it, the story put together like that. And I literally cried buckets through, through the movie the first time I watched it because you know I got to essentially meet the people that worked so hard before I was even born yeah. to fight for the rights of the disabled. Yeah, no, that's really incredible. And I, and I had never heard the story before watching this film. So for me, it was all new as well. Like, um, so, and, and my brother um, is legally blind. And so my mother worked with the PTA um, with the um, special education of the school. So that was my only kind of interaction, but I knew nothing about this. So this for me was tremendous. Now, mm -hmm. I know we actually have a really wonderful group of people here tonight who have some many questions. So I know that we'd really like to start in right away with that, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. okay. So then I think that Jennifer Miller-Smith, if you wouldn't mind, um, unmuting yourself and asking the first question for Mimi. I'm sure she would love to be able to, to answer that for you. Can you go? There you go. Go ahead. I was just um, scrolling up for my first question. <laughs> oh, here it is. What's next in the disability movement and what can we all do? Okay, so we have the ADA is 31 years old now, I think <laughs> I have a, and we still have a long way to go, honestly. Um, the, dis the ADA is the floor. Um, so it is the legal minimum. Like when I moved into this apartment, I had to fight to get a ramp poured. So I had to get a, you know, and when I lived in my former apartment building, like the ramp was way too steep, but it was built in the 1920s. So they weren't required um, to have a ramp that fit the ADA, which is for every, every inch of drop, you have to have 12 inches of ramp. So it's like a one 12 ratio. And we do have a really long way to go. Um, I, I have the Medicaid waiver program so that pays for my uh, personal care attendant who comes three times a week. I get I think nine hours a week paid for by the state of Indiana um, to have a PCA. And so that is the home-based, uh, what is it? The home-based um, community, home-based community-based um, program where Basically, it's nursing home level care living in my own home. So that doesn't get a lot of funding. Mm -hmm. um, so I work for the city. I cannot work more than 27 hours a week. Otherwise, I could potentially lose my funding. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's interesting information for us to kind of like go forward with. So I really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Yeah. All right, so we, we've still got, like you said, a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. All right, well then um, I'd like to go to the next question with Wes. Wes, you had a question, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Mimi. Wes, are you able to do that? Do you need me to? There you go. Awesome. Um, thank you, Mimi. Um, good to see you. So my question is, what, what do candidates, campaigns, or Democratic parties across the country, what do we, they need to do in terms of accessibility? So making sure that disabled people are engaged in the campaign, like, so that you know what disabled disabled people want and need those issues are brought to the forefront you know like the home-based um, funding program for uh, medical needs um, I, I know um, 
President Biden recently signed an executive order to get rid of the substandard minimum wage because I have disabled friends who have worked in sheltered web, sh sheltered workshops and they've made a dollar an hour less mm. and it's legal. So. Wow, that's, that's terrific. Yeah. Okay. And it's, a, it's a part of the 504. Okay. All right. Uh, Christy, I think you're next actually with your question. Um, if you can unmute yourself and, and ask me. Um, oh, I had put a couple in there. Um, yeah. Latest thought, uh, since you were talking about, um, um, I guess, um, government programs, um, I, I was wondering about how um, the uh, federal um, law pertains to um, jobs programs. Um, because you were just talking about um, underpaying, but not. Uh, but I have a concern about not just underpaying, but um, how we encourage private industry to create jobs or allow people who have special needs to do work more than the the traditional menial, low um, paying jobs that are usually associated with um, people with um, mental or um, physical disabilities. So um, are there any uh, jobs programs or laws coming up that would um, help boost that? Because I, I'm, I'm sure it would be through like tax incentives or, or something for jobs. So um, I used um, the Department of Developmental Disabilities uh, through the vocational rehabilitation um, to help me um, get this chair here. This chair was $72,000, but it is a complex rehab power wheelchair. And those are things that Medicare doesn't generally pay for. Like it'll pay for the, the wheelbase and the seating, but it won't pay for the seat lift or the standing feature. Um, the special joystick I have because of my fingers, um, stuff like that isn't paid for. Um, they get Medicare only pays a like a standard rate, which is way under what the actual chair costs. Right. Um, I understand um, that we have through um, Medicaid or programs that will help people get the the tools to get mm -hmm. to work, but I'm asking about. Um, I guess, accessibility for jobs that, you know, cause I keep on hearing um, and seeing projects where, you know, they're, we're all supposed to applaud the local bakery for hiring someone with uh, a disability. But yeah, um, yeah. It, I want to reference back to the, to the facilities that we saw back um, in the, um, the documentary where, the only reason those people were in those terrible conditions were that they were seen as unwanted and useless. And um, not only by society, but probably by themselves because they weren't brought to their full potential. And I'm just asking, we can't warehouse people. We have to give them meaningful work. How do we do um, not just through physical like your chairs and ramps, but actually find them somewhere to go that mm -hmm. pay them and is actual real work. Yeah. That is so the vocational rehabilitation program also paid for job training and job coaching for me to help me get back in the workforce. Um, Cause I'd been out of the workforce for many years because I was actually let go from a job um, because of my disability and it took out my confidence so that those like vocational rehabilitation and organizations, local organizations in South Bend are like ADEC um, and Benchmark Human Services. They provide the coaching and the employment services 
and even um, benefits analysis, which I had done to help me know exactly how much I could work without losing my benefits. Okay, all right. Well, that that's in really interesting. And I know that I know that one of the questions that I was hoping to bring up was something that um, Emily, when she was on the campaign, brought up tremendously, and was something that I never knew about. That's a really expensive chair that you just mentioned. If you go on an airline or anything like that, how concerned are you when you go on that airline that you're going to get your chair back the way that you want it? My biggest fear when I travel. Um, I've had five chairs destroyed by the airlines in the last 11 years. Um, the, yeah, they, they terrify me. Like I like to fly, but I never know if my chair is going to be in one piece when I get to, when I get to where I'm going. Yep. 25 chairs every day are damaged by airlines. Well, is there anything that we can do on that to help with too? Is there like- um, There is a research going, um, there's research, they're trying to research to figure out how we can stay in our chairs on, um, on the airline. Oh, okay. Like the tie downs for buses. Like my chair is equipped with four of them and trying to use those um, so me, I haven't flown with this chair yet, but I was told to take a video of me explaining it to the baggage handlers exactly how to manage my, take care of my chair and to wrap everything, um, in bubble wrap and take off anything that might fall off because chairs are expensive yeah. and it, they, it's not gonna take me a month to get this chair repaired if it's broken. It's gonna take six months minimum to get my chair mm. fixed. Six months, that's... Yeah, so it took me a year and a half to get this chair. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. Um, so it's definitely something on our radar and we know, you know through that. Um, Susan, I know that you had a question. Would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself for your question? Or I'm sorry, someone was talking in the room. Who am I unmuting? I'm sorry, Susan. Susan oh. had a question, I believe. And yes, Senator Duckworth is fantastic. I love yeah. her advocacy. Yeah. Yep, she's our queen. <laughs> like like the comment said. I love that. <laughs> Susan, you should see an invitation of me. Yeah. Oh yeah. I can't find my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want me to go ahead? I think I have it um here. It was it was quite it, there were quite a few, so I might just kind of like pick, pick okay, one go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Right? Okay. <laughs> Um, Susan's question was, um, what is harder to live with, a physical disability or an intellectual disability? And what can disabled people teach able-bodied people? Okay, so uh, I have dyslexia on top of um, my physical disability. Uh, so I went through special education and it wasn't the it wasn't great, my experience in special education. Um, but when I talk to kids who are at the school who, that I talk to and um, I put on a whole lesson plan about living with a disability and it's, it's both invisible and visible disabilities. Um, and we do things like teach them how to play wheelchair basketball. And we always make it fun at the end by putting a game of wheelchair basketball, the oldest students against the teachers. And it's a hit every year. And they beg us to come back every year. And we, Emily and I, that's how we met, um, was giving these presentations about 
living with a disability. So we have a lot to teach the able-bodied world. And in fact, my best friend has cerebral palsy and she taught me how to live with a disability because we would go to anime conventions together and I would always go with her because I would push her when I could walk. And then after, after I was disabled, I didn't get to go to a spinal cord rehab facility. And so I basically had to teach myself how to live in a world that wasn't accessible to me because I'm, my parents moved to Bedford, after, Bedford, Indiana, it's about 25. Oh yes, I mean, Emily Vorty, yes. <laughs> um, my hometown of Bedford, Indiana was not accessible. We had limestone curb cuts. And when I moved to, yes, yeah, when I moved to South Bend, it was so different. It was so accessible. It was like a breath of fresh air, mm. like not having to fight just across the street. And I, I know that um, we're going to finish up um, now, I think, because um, it, the film ran longer than I think that we thought. But I think one of the things that we would love to know is even in South Bend. Oh, I'm so sorry, Deborah. Yes, you did. Re OK, let me um, leave the last question actually for Deborah. Actually, if you can unmute her, that would be wonderful. When you're able to, Deborah, go right ahead. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I came to this program tonight because I have two friends uh, that are wheelchair bound in the human library. Uh, and my librarians from Indiana, and I think Kaz has heard me mention this and some of the other, I had no idea. I thought I was a pretty knowledgeable person. I had no idea. And I'm just blown away. And I certainly appreciate all this information and I think this the film is a must-see for everybody so I thank you it really wasn't a question other than well, how can we share it and where could I see it again how can I tell people about it thank you absolutely. Obi-Wan no <laughs> no no absolutely <laughs> there's a great way it really was a an, it really was an extraordinary documentary and I'm so glad that we watched it together um but you can always post this on your social media pages and tell your friends at work and tell your friends, you know, if, if, if you're part of a church group or a book club or anything like that, and tell them to watch this film because it really is life changing because the more we educate people on where we were to where we need to go, I think that's absolutely a must. And with that, Mimi, I'm gonna leave um, the, your last thoughts with you on what we can do to continue in our education. So um, I know a lot of rural towns um, because I'm one. I'm from one. Um, they're not really sometimes all the way accessible. Like even a couple of weeks ago, they poured new curb cuts in South Bend, and the curb cut was like four inches away from the road. And I was like, I saw it, and I was like. Mm that's not the way you do it so they actually had to come in and put an asphalt patch to match up the curb cut with the road and then so I I often will post you know I'm truly authentic when I'm on social media um when I'm having accessibility problems um I I post it um especially uh parking Parking. Um, I have a wheelchair van. I often get my van blocked in um, just by, because people don't really realize that the strikeout is not a parking spot. Um, just yesterday, I got blocked in by a motorcycle. I had to wait until he moved so that I could get my ramp down and continue on with my day. I've had to wait two hours before for somebody to come. Wow, that's, that's irresponsible. Well, I definitely will say, I know what kind of pictures I'll be taking uh, shortly. 
<laughs> yeah. And, and letting people know that it's not cool. I, and I think that that's something that maybe we all can do that. I think that's something very easily we can do to just kind of like make awareness that, you know, Hey, yeah. this is going to keep people from living their lives. Mm -hmm. you yeah. know? So, and often it's other disabled people, especially <laughs> senior citizens that park in that strikeout. They're just not educated on what that's for. That or they don't care. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've been blocked in by many a person with a placard or a plate. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well thank you. Oh, yes. Captions okay. and yeah. alt, alt text your photos. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for everyone for your insightful questions and for bringing up these issues. And Mimi, thank you so much for being here tonight. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you and everyone have a great night and post and let everybody know about this fantastic, fantastic documentary. Yeah, have a good night, everybody. <laughs>